So I'm standing here on stage looking out at the auditorium with 700 earthlings in. Most of you I've never met, but I know that there's one thing that connects us all intellectually. There's some point where we've all asked the question, are we alone in the universe? Is there any other life out there? So I'm not going to try to answer this question for you. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you how we can answer it. I'm going to make the case this is something that we can answer in our lifetime, something that we really should answer. So, how are we going to do that? Well, let's start in the movies, because there's always aliens in the movies. And they're hominoid. They speak English. <laughs> the ones making decisions are usually male. <laughs> it's true. It happens in the movies. But fortunately, we're in real life here. And in real life, we can look at data. And we want data for what is a planet with life like. And here it is. It's Earth. It's the only data we have. But how will we look? Well, We've got to ask them the questions, what are we looking for? Are we looking for people who come to TEDx talks? Are we looking for technological civilization where we can broadcast things out on the internet or in radio waves? Well, then we've only got 60 or 100 years of data. That's how long we've been broadcasting radio waves. So should we listen, wait for ET to ring up, say, hi, do you want to come to our TEDx? No, I don't think so. The problem is, for that 60 or 100 years, we've also had nuclear weapons. We've had the ability to destroy our species for the same time that we've been able to communicate. So we're in a period of technological adolescence. We do not know how long that will last. It is a terrible thing to go looking for. So what's next? We could look for Homo sapiens, 200,000 years, a little better. Or we could look for life on Earth. We could look for the 4,000 million years of life evolving on Earth. And that's the best thing to look for on other planets, to look for life in itself, to look for fundamental properties of that life. So back to Earth. What do we know about life? And this is kind of where I come in. I study the evolution of life and the planet together. And what do we know about them? We know that Earth is entirely permeated by life. We're used to life on the surface, but if you go 10 kilometers up into the clouds, there's bacteria that will grow in those cloud droplets. If we go 10 kilometers down into the crust, there's bacteria growing in the rocks there. Earth is pervasively contaminated by life. It is everywhere. <laughs> and it's also profoundly modifying the environment. And that's the thing that we need in the context of astrobiology, the fact that we can find clues to life's existence in the environment. The fact is, is that the physical and chemical environments of Earth have co-evolved with life in this intricate dance, which is fascinating to study. Four decades ago, that was what James Lovelock called Gaia. And at the same time, he developed the ideas that would help us look for life on other planets. So we're going to look in the atmosphere. The reason is, is that that's where life will dump its garbage. <laughs> so what's in the atmosphere today? We have 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, 400 parts per million carbon dioxide, and rising, 2 parts per million methane. Each one of those gases I've mentioned, with the exception of the noble gas argon, is actively cycled through the biosphere. If there was no life on Earth, the atmosphere would look nothing like this. So let's take two of those gases. Let's take oxygen. That is a toxic waste product of plants and algae and cyanobacteria, things that split water to make energy using sunlight. That oxygen is just a waste product. They just discard it, hope something else will deal with it. A little bit like sewage in Victoria. <laughs> it's true. Now, we're doing OK, because we've evolved to protect ourselves from that oxygen and also to use it in our metabolism. We're breaking down organic carbon with oxygen as we sit here, and that's giving us energy. Now, let's talk about another gas. We could talk about methane a colorless, odorless gas, if you take that organic matter, put it in somewhere where oxygen can't get to. You know, in the 
take it to Sanitary Inlet, put it in the anoxic mud at the bottom of there. Organic matter will get broken down. And methane is one of the products you get. Now, if you've got oxygen in the atmosphere and also methane, that methane's only going to last 10 years. It'll just react away with the methane. So that we look at the atmosphere of Earth, we see oxygen and methane together. We're seeing a living, breathing planet. We know there is life on Earth. Now, if we do that same analysis to the atmosphere of any other planet in the solar system, we find they're all dead. Earth is the only place we know of life, so that is the best place to start looking. Nowhere else in the solar system. Okay, we'll come back to that later. But how are we going to do that? How are we going to find out what's in the atmosphere of another planet to find out if there's life? Well, we're going to point our telescope at it. We're going to gather photons from whatever other planet we're interested in. And you'll think about splitting that light. Think about holding up a prism to the sunlight. We're going to split that light into different wavelengths. We'll have blue at the short wavelength, through green, onto red at the longer wavelength. And if our eyes went out further, we'd see into the near-infrared and the thermal infrared. And then we could make some plots like these. On the left-hand side, we've got the sunlight that the planet's reflecting. That looks kind of jaggedy, because it's come through the atmosphere of the sun before it gets to Earth. On the right-hand side, we've got the thermal emission from Earth. Just the energy that the planet's emitting, we're all emitting, just because we have a non-zero temperature. Along the bottom is wavelength, so different wavelengths of light and then different wavelengths of thermal radiation. So let's put a gas in that. We'll start off with water. That's taking chunks out of the spectrum that we've got. The reason is, is that water will absorb electromagnetic radiation. It's absorbing energy that we emit from the planet. So that's why we have a greenhouse effect, because we take a chunk out of that spectrum. We're emitting less radiation out to space. We'll add in another. That's carbon dioxide. So we've got most of the greenhouse effect of Earth there. But if we pointed our telescope at a planet, and we saw these chunks out of the spectrum, we'd say, oh, well, this is a planet with water and carbon dioxide. Yeah, that's nice. We found something. So let's add some more stuff in. Let's add in oxygen, one of our biogenic gases. Let's add in ozone, too. Ozone's a photochemical product of oxygen. You put oxygen in the atmosphere above a percent. Oxygen's been about a, above a percent for two and a half billion years on Earth in something called the Great Oxidation, one of the coolest time periods in Earth's history. Not that I did my PhD on it. I'm not biased. <laughs> but um, see that whacking great chunk that ozone takes out of the spectrum? So we can say, oh, we see that up. Ozone, we've seen a planet that's got abundant oxygen in its atmosphere. And the most likely reason for finding that is that there's photosynthesis. There's organisms breaking up water, making oxygen as their byproduct, dumping that into the atmosphere. There's other ways we can make oxygen. They're unlikely, but they're possible. So we want to look for more. Let's look for that methane, too. And you can see there's a little sliver there that methane's taking off that oxygen wasn't. And if you zoomed in, that would look really good. You just can't see it here. But you find those two together. Oxygen's in the atmosphere, methane's in the atmosphere, but methane can only last for 10 years with oxygen. So we've got a living, breathing planet. Just by pointing our telescope at a planet far away, We've seen it being alive. We've seen it breathing. So that is the method of detecting life by atmospheric analysis. You do that to any other planet in the solar system, they're dead. That's what we know. So where are we going to look? Well, the good thing is that just as we can look at Earth here, it turns out we can now find planets around other stars. 20 years ago, the first planet around another star was detected. Now, that's amazing. An amazing feat in astronomy. And now we know of 1,800 definite planets around other stars. We know of another 4,200 that are called planetary candidates. We think they're there. 
We're not quite sure, we need more data. But it turns out if you do the statistics, that most stars have planets. If you look out into the night sky, those uncountable number of stars, there is probably about a planet around every one of them. And soon we'll be able to figure out the number of Earth-like planets. So those are, when I say Earth-like, what do I mean? I mean not Jupiter. You can't go and look for life like Earth life on Jupiter. It would kind of fall through all the gas. It wouldn't really work. So we're looking for planets that are, you know, kind of about the same distance from their star as Earth, that probably have about the same temperature. That's a good place to look. And we'll be able to figure out how many of them there are quite soon. So what do we need to do? We need to find this life. We've got to build some telescopes. We've got to build, the first one is a space telescope that will be the one that can identify the right planets to look at, the right candidate planets that are a bit Earth-like. We can go look for life on them. Price point of a space telescope to do that? One or two billion. <laughs> Cost of a sewage system in Victoria? One billion. <laughs> Your choice. But then we want to build the really exciting one. Once we've found, OK, this is a good planet to go look at, we want the telescope that's going to get that spectrum, pipe that spectrum directly to my office, I hope, and let me look at it. The, the mission architecture for that is something called Terrestrial Planet Finder. The cost of something like that would be about $10 billion. But it's something we could do. What else costs that kind of money? You want to buy Canada 65 F-35 jets? That's going to cost somewhere between 45 and $125 billion. So again, your choice. <laughs> but this is something we can do. The technology exists. There's a lot of scientists like me who would love to do this. So I'd say this should be a scientific priority of ours. And if we look in history, we can see some of the reasons why. The best thing is to go back to the Copernican Revolution, when it was found that Earth was not, in fact, the center of the universe. Earth was just one of a few planets that orbited around the sun. We were nothing special. We were just one of a few planets. And that changed the relationship between science and religion and power forever. Now, with the discovery of exoplanets, that Copernican revolution has been completed. We know that planets are nothing special. There are many planets like ours in the universe. So what about life? At the moment, we're the only life that we know of in the universe. If we think of the consequence of finding life on another planet. That would be like Copernicus meets Darwin. Think of the consequence for how that will change everything about our society, our power, our science. That is something that we can do in the next 20 years. That is something we should do. That, I would say, is knowledge worth pursuing. Thank you.